The erratic national efforts to meet the 2% and 20% goals often ignored both the steady reduction in and aging of key aspects of the major weapons and military systems in many countries, as well as the continued dependence of many Eastern European members on weapons and systems that they had inherited from the former Soviet Union, FSU, and where they no longer had access to. Or purchased the upgrades, modernization, and updated weapons and C4I systems for such weapons. Above all, this goal never addressed the fact that even the simplest comparisons of NATO force planning and spending priorities by country show that security must be based on nation by nation plans and not NATO wide goals. As a result, NATO did far too little to correct a situation where there was so little effort to examine what level of spending was actually needed to correct the deficiencies in any given country's force posture. Modernization, readiness, and training and sustainability, or whether current spending levels are meeting the 2% would ever be adequate. Not to mention when a given country could actually meet the necessary goals. Furthermore, any effort toward actually reaching 2% of GDP was erratic at best. NATO did report some increases in spending as a percent of GDP in constant $2015 after 2014. But its most recent estimate of actual spending levels, issued in June 2021, found that 19 of its 30 members were still under 2%, including 1.5% for Germany, which had let its military forces go. Hollow, and 10 countries spending under 1.5%. Even a quick glance at the weapons holdings of many member countries, based on reporting by sources like the IISS and commercial sources like IHS Jane's, shows that even countries that did meet the 2% goal usually needed to spend something like 3% or more of their GDP to correct these problems. Offset the aging of their existing major weapons and avoid a slow but steady cut in force size. In practice, such a review could also not reveal cuts in readiness. Failures to train at adequate and realistic levels, major problems in interoperability, and the failure to modernize intelligence, command and control, and precision weapons. The percentage spending goals set by NATO ministers were not practical for many states, given their domestic politics and economies. For example, these goals had only limited overall impact in maintaining the force strength of the Eastern European forces in the area near the Russian border and in converting them from Soviet to interoperable R. Common weapons systems with the forces of older members of NATO. Here, it should be stressed that the US and NATO European militaries, and the NATO military commands, often did try to set the right priorities during the Obama and Trump administrations, as did the Secretary General and international staff. Driven by the United States, however, defense ministers focused on spending 2% of GDP on defense by 2024. Regardless of how long it took to meet that goal and how any rise in spending was spent. During the Trump administration, U.S. efforts to shift more of the spending burden to Europe at the political level, with little practical impact on force planning, often meant that any added spending was wasted on pockets of improvement that did not alter overall national force capabilities or offset the continued reliance of given members on aging and declining. Fleets of Soviet era systems. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has shown how dangerous this approach to NATO force planning can be. It has shown that the Russian threat is still all too real. As has Russia's focus on new nuclear forces, long range precision conventional strike, information, and cyber warfare. And the spoiler role it is playing in Syria and in sponsoring the use of Russian mercenaries. NATO needs to revitalize its force planning exercises of the 1960s. It needs to focus on country by county needs and force improvement priorities, not vague alliance wide spending goals. The U.S. also needs to capitalize on the new willingness of key countries like Germany to spend on the forces NATO needs, 
make further improvements in the U.S. ability to project forces into the forward area, and support NATO countries in the rear to rapidly deploy forward. NATO should focus on creating realistic member country force plans that set the right priorities for force modernization, interoperability, join all domain operations, and integration of common approaches to coping with emerging and disruptive technologies (EDTs). The U.S. must abandon its destructive emphasis on burden sharing and raising defense spending as percent of GDP and procurement. And it must now focus on finding the best common solutions to the wide mix of different problems and challenges that each of its 29 allies, Sweden and Finland, now face. NATO should also capitalize on the new momentum for meaningful planning created by the Russian invasion of Ukraine by taking full advantage of global intelligence, space, cyber. And the C4I and battle management capabilities of larger and wealthier countries like the United States, as well as develop U.S. and NATO European nuclear and long-range precision conventional strike forces to raise the threshold of deterrence in the area where Russia still has its greatest military advantage. In doing so, both the U.S. And its NATO strategic partners need to recognize that it will take at least three to four years to complete such an effort, and that the new force planning effort will need to be steadily updated, not only to deter and defend against Russia, but to aid NATO in out-of-area operations and in dealing with extremism in China. The U.S. And its partners must also recognize that sustaining the funding of the necessary effort will pose a major challenge, and that cooperation with the EU will be even more important at the economic level than the security one. Here, the lessons of the NATO force planning exercise that was carried out at the peak of the Cold War in the 1960s are still critical. First, as is the case with the U.S. defense effort. Strategy per se is meaningless unless it is tied to specific plans, programs, and budgets. Second, real progress takes time and patience, as well as constant, ongoing efforts to develop suitable plans, programs, and budgets. Third, such an effort must look at least five years ahead and will require constant, ongoing work at both the NATO and national level to actually implement the necessary effort. With ongoing efforts to roll the five-year plan forward every year and regularly adapt to ongoing changes in events. Fourth, no effort is meaningful that does not focus on country-by-country country efforts that recognize domestic political realities and constraints. Getting what you can is far more important than seeking what you cannot. Fifth, such an effort must be based on net assessments, not abstract goals or concepts. Finally, such efforts must be transparent enough to convince the civil power elite in the U.S., Europe, and Canada, and as much of the public as possible, that such efforts are valid and necessary. This means reporting progress on a nation-by-nation -nation basis, even when this is sometimes embarrassing, including describing both the Russian threat and rate of overall improvement in the balance, deterrence, and defense. Overclassification and a lack of public transparency can be as much of a de facto enemy as foreign threats. The war in Ukraine has shocked most American and European publics and politicians, as well as the publics and politicians in most advanced Asian states and other regions of the world, into facing the realities of a world where two major authoritarian states pose a continuing threat and many developing states are poor. Divided or involved in civil war, and have failed governments or authoritarian states. That shock, however, is all too likely to be temporary, and both the U.S. and its allies face major civil challenges and needs for government resources. Much will depend on showing the majority in democratic states that there are valid plans to meeting valid needs. And one that must be given a high priority in the face of threats like COVID and the challenges in raising civil living standards and creating social opportunities and equality. The U.S.
and its NATO allies need to act quickly to build on the momentum that the tragedy in Ukraine has created. They also need to earn the trust of their publics. Calls for patriotism and sacrifice need to be supported in full detail. No strategy based on rhetoric and the phrase, trust me, is valid, or even tolerable, in a democratic society. It is one of the ironies of the Russian invasion of Ukraine that if Russia had not invaded, U.S. national security planning, and the president's FY2023 budget, would have focused on China and threats like Iran and North Korea. The sudden flow of U.S. and other Western military aid to Ukraine as well as the focus on Putin as a tyrant would never have taken place. Europe was not prepared to make serious increases and changes in its force posture. And the U.S. was focusing on China and the military balance in the Indo-Pacific region. The U.S. was doing this because China had become a far larger economic power than Russia. And it was becoming far more competitive with the United States in terms of military capabilities in the Indo-Pacific region.